Welcome to US City 360. I'm your host, Dilbar Shatterson, and today we're coming to you from Staten Island, where the waves you see here were once a devastating force of nature one year ago during Superstorm Sandy, where lives, homes, and livelihoods permanently transformed. But what's also permanently changed is our climate. And according to a September report released by the UN's International Panel on Climate Change, human influence is considered to be one of the most dominant factors of climate change in the past half century. And here to help us better understand our carbon footprint is here with me now, filmmaker Jeff Orlovsky. So thank you for being with us, Jeff. Thank you very much, yeah. So in the film, you follow uh, the photographer James Blaylock. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the discoveries that you made. Through this project, through the Extreme Ice Survey, we had the opportunity to go to Greenland and to Iceland and Alaska and see all around the, the Northern Hemisphere how, how ice is changing and how it's changing very rapidly. How do you feel that being able to see it firsthand gives you an advantage in telling this kind of story. Being able to go to those places, Greenland, Iceland, and Alaska, and, and other Arctic regions, um, you actually see the process of climate change in action. You see where the ice is melting, where it's transferring from glaciers directly to sea level rise. And so it's a very tangible way for people to wrap their heads around this invisible problem of climate change. And we were trying to visualize that for people. So with that, let's actually go take a look and see exactly what's happened since the storm. As this storm moves farther north, it will expand. It's just really moving into a question of where. The East Coast grinding to a halt as Hurricane Sandy prepares to make landfall. We should not underestimate the impact of the storm, and we should not assume the predictions will be wrong. This is a serious and big storm. The MTA has announced that they will start shutting down service subway starting at 7 tonight. Tens of thousands of people were ordered to evacuate coastal areas on Sunday. As Hurricane Sandy is on her way. I've uh, never witnessed anything like this. Oh my god! Oh my god! What the hell is this? Something yeah, just exploded. We are hoping there are no people still in these homes because there's not much left. We knew that Hurricane Sandy was going to be serious. The city also gave warnings for previous hurricanes, and then they didn't cause serious damage. But when I woke up in the morning, Chinatown called and said they established an emergency relief center. During the power outage that lasted for two days, we thought about how we would be able to provide hot food. Someone from the office called me and said, hey, we need people to help out in Chinatown, where we have to cook in the dark, and then we have to bring the food to the shelter. That's my very first shooting of Sandy. We received a call from the Red Cross indicating that in Staten Island, areas neighboring the ocean were in critical condition. Brother George leaded us to those areas to investigate the extent of damage. However, we didn't have gasoline. Volunteers from Washington, D.C. and Boston brought container after container of gasoline to the office. The situation at that time still scares me to this day. It was devastating. The Salvation Army and Red Cross had mentioned that hot food would be needed. We brought with us 300 servings of egg soup on our first trip. We bring it from Queens. Anyone need a hot soup? They're all cleaning up their home. In such cold weather, what they needed most was something warm. Very good, very good. Sir, you want some soup? No? You had enough? We were going to distribute hot food by far Rockaway. When we got there, we saw a mountain of clothes. 
People from all over the country have been driving truckloads of clothes and food down here. We are so grateful to everybody who has come down. Your organization, if our government forgets us, our neighbors aren't going to forget us. By the shore winds always gush. How do we work without power? Fortunately, at that time, DC volunteers sent over a generator. We felt we haven't done a lot. However, we wish to do as much as we could. So we came to help. Everyone knew it would be very cold, but I felt warm in my heart. At the time, Brother George started communicating with U.S. headquarters, and we established an emergency relief center in the eastern region. All the funds we give come from individual contributions. Siji volunteers around the world worked hard to fundraise for us, so we had to use each penny carefully. We had to plan how we would distribute the goods to the victims. The reason you are here is we are looking for vulnerable households that we can continue to help them. So we figured out we need your help. All these COA volunteers, they are hurricane victims too. This gives us an opportunity to go to their communities and do some distribution. They know Tsiji and they want to do something like what we do, giving back to the community. Because we live in the U.S., most of our lives we stay in the U.S. We're growing up and planting our roots here. When we sang the song, we were all emotionally touched. Nothing in words can describe what we felt. Because we are all families. Today, if we can connect all ethnicity groups and can unite as one, we have to do it from our communities to have everyone connecting physically and emotionally, regardless of differences in culture and ethnicity. We have to let them feel love, compassion. I believe America can awaken and can help its neighboring countries in need. While some progress has certainly occurred since the storm, Jeff, as a native Staten Islander, how do you feel something like Sandy impact your community? How does it feel to see that in the place where you grew up? Everybody got to see a lot of horrific footage coming out of Sandy. Um, we were in New York releasing Chasing Ice right about that time as well, which was kind of shocking, the juxtaposition of our film about climate change and, and seeing the real tangible consequences of climate change happening. You know, it, it was devastating to see these impacts happening to places where I grew up. Um, the, the pond nearby where I spent my childhood kind of learning how to fish in that pond, it's not there anymore. It completely was breached by Sandy and it's just all salt water now. Um, these consequences happened all across Staten Island, all across New York City, and it's, it's having real impact on people's homes and people's families. To some degree, it's sad, but it requires events like this for people to understand what climate change means and what kind of impact it's gonna have. Now, in trying to alleviate some of the issues that come as a result of natural disasters, uh, Master Zheng Yan has often said, we are running out of time. Yeah. And there's a moment in the film where it mentions, we have no time. Yeah. So what's your take on time? We, we're already seeing the consequences of climate change. There's been a, a five-fold increase in natural disasters in North America in the last 30 years. As people, as citizens of this planet, we're seeing consequences of man-made climate change already. That said, those circumstances are only going to get worse if we keep doing things at, at the status quo. We really need to change how we consume energy and where we get our energy from um, if we're going to live on a sustainable planet, if, if humanity is going to have a sustainable kind of infrastructure and foundation for us to have progress on top of. Well, now let's go take a look and see another local who is working hard to make his community healthy. The first screenings that I did were knocking on doors and uh, having to be, uh, have doors slammed on me or sometimes people were afraid because there were so many people stealing and from victims of Hurricane Sandy, they were lying to them and taking their money. So it was very difficult. 
Hola, Natalia. Yo me llamo John Reyes. Very frustrating, people closing the door. Here is a six foot four man of color representing a Chinese organization. Somehow it didn't fit. ¿En qué manera le podemos ayudar nosotros? De ese chiste, hemos una foundation internacional. But knocking on doors and finally gaining entrance, letting them know what Sitchi was all about, how we want to help the victims of Hurricane Sandy. And then after one of them was helped, then they would spread the word to their neighbors and it made it a lot easier. Yo me llamo John Reyes, soy de Sitchi. Nosotros no este, compartimos esta información con el gobierno. More than 100 screenings, 110 or so. And that is me taking the paperwork from the home screening, taking it back to the office, turning it in, and they review the information. I call them back, make a date to visit them, and then I come with two or three commissioners, volunteers, and I'm briefing them on the information before we get to the first home visit. Okay, here we go. We're here. Would you mind to tell us about this case? The name is Natalia Perez. They just had a baby. First home visit, I become a translator, translating from English to Spanish, from Spanish to English. The commissioners can ask questions based on the information that I wrote, and they can ask additional questions so that they can determine what is the need of this family and how can we help them. It's right around this corner. Right around the corner. It's a court, right? I think this is the first right. court. Yes. Yeah. How you can find this place? Yeah, the, the streets are so huh? small. Get a baby. So that we can have more infusement of charity, love, respect, and the Suchi way of hands-on charity. After we interview all this family, so we have decide what kind of help we're gonna help this family, right? Now we this we just we just help them. They become they become a child. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so. And uh, well over 250, 300 home visits with volunteers. <laughs> All the work that we've done for Sandy victims, we're talking close to $10 million or more for close to 15,000 families. We've done so much, and we need to leave a legacy that respects all the hard work that we've put in. I started going on home visit with the Sushi team the very first day on 17th of June, I think. And the phone number is... So I was really impressed, and... Uh, I mean, the way it was organized, I mean, I have never seen such organized uh, work before. We have visiting greater New York area, Far Rockaway, Coney Island, Brighton Beach. We have seen different ethnic groups, their lives. They live in the dark corners of New York. Salam, salam. Nice to meet you. Nice he used to live here at the time of Sandy. Yeah, but it's no. closed. Yeah, it's closed. Ah. Um, <laughs> actually, his room is very small, and uh, uh, there is not, uh, no space for even two people to stand there and interview him. That's why we are standing outside and we are interviewing him here. He says that he works like eight or ten hours a day, and they just pay him $150 uh, for week. He's yeah, basically exactly. uh, paying with this room, like $500 for this small room. I mean, we, we came to know about his story, how he has to send back his family back to Pakistan after uh, Hurricane Sandy because he has no place and uh, he lost everything over there. Sometimes he has to send them like $200 or $300, but uh, when he is out of money, he cannot even send them those money. So they are living there. They are uh, on their own right now. It's not the first time. It's, I think, the second time I'm visiting him. To, at his uh, workplace, I visited him twice. I just wanted to see how he's working and uh, what are the conditions in which he's working. They're really very tough. I felt like if anything I can do in any capacity, so that he can be helped in one way or the other, or his life can become a little bit more easier. If I can do anything, believe me, if anything is in my hand, I'm going to do that. Uh, teacher, okay. you All right. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. This is the love from no, the whole no, no. world. Thank you. I'm thankful to you and your organization and making him realize that we are all behind him. So it's really great. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Baba. Thank you. Baba means thank you, guys. Really. 
Look at the largest city in the world. Look at all these people from different countries and different ethnic backgrounds that do not have legal status. Their life is very, very tough. Many of them do not know whether or not they can get their next meal. Volunteering with Zuchi is not tiring. It is actually fulfilling and joyful. I am really grateful Master Cheng Yan has shared her wisdom with us, allowing us to practice on the path of Bodhisattva and allowing us to appreciate the suffering people around the world have to endure. Almost as much as we have new volunteers and community partners helping in our relief efforts, we've got new disasters springing up right and left. And of course, considering the floods that happened in Colorado recently, when I heard that you were also based in Colorado and also that your family home was here with Sandy, I thought, you can't get away from this. Yeah. So what was that like for you in Colorado? Just a couple weeks ago, uh, with the flooding in Colorado, we had to evacuate our office, and my house got very heavily damaged. I mean, flood water was eroding away at, our, at the foundation of our house. Pylons had fallen out of the house. Um, we had a, basically a river that went straight into my bedroom window and flooded the entire first floor of the house with six inches of mud. I mean, we, there was just so much destruction and so much that we just had to end up throwing out and so much work that went into just keeping the house like stable and safe. Um, these are things where, you know, I'd never expected a flood to come hit where I live. Um, it's, it's one of those once in a hundred year events, but they're starting to happen much more frequently in these areas. Um, there were people who died on my street in Colorado as well. Um, these are, are real consequences. When people, when people talk about, so what does climate change matter? They don't typically connect the dots to extreme weather like this. They think that, oh, we've, we've always had hurricanes and storms, but they don't typically understand that we're making them worse right now. So actually in connection to Hurricane Sandy and also to the floods that happened in Colorado, those two natural disasters, there's actually a gentleman here in Staten Island who went to Colorado and also tried to apply the knowledge that he learned in Sandy there. So let's go take a look at him now. So my name is Mike Hoffman. I live on Staten Island. I currently work as a co-founder and board member for Yellow Boots Disaster Relief and uh, assist the people affected in tragedy. Being that the way Sandy hit us, we're very familiar with the way floods and the, the different effects and one of the main missions of Yellow Boots was to be able to respond and educate so other people aren't left dealing with it, not knowing anything the same way we were. So we took that knowledge, we brought it to Colorado to educate them, most specifically on you know, the threats and the handlings and the preparedness and how to prevent you know, major mold issues. You know, it's just lack of information. It's not common day knowledge. You, know, you, you don't learn about mold and, and, and things like that on a regular basis unless you're a scientist. Well, Sandy helped change my career. Sandy took my job. So Sandy left me unemployed, and there was people in need. And I've said this before, there's certain times in your life where there's just a switch that clicks in you as a human being to, to do a more humanitarian thing, and there's things that are bigger than you yourself. You look at the hundreds of people in earshot that are affected, that were devastated, and you, you can't just sit back and do nothing. So uh, we came together on 9-11 on to create a memorial for those that have passed during Hurricane uh, Sandy. You know, and people who come to visit can see the symbolism of how Staten Island came together strong and to overcome and to still keep, there's still the work that's ahead that we're still doing going on. But it's basically to get people over the hump and to start getting everything back to the new normal. It's beautiful. Well, that's not happening. But between immediate needs, all the way to restore, we've touched over 2,000 homes. Whether it be we provided them with clothing and, and furniture, you know, by connecting the dots, to doing the demo, to doing the mold remediation, to rebuild, to providing materials so they can get the rebuild done. You know, we've touched homes in many different ways. My name is Jason Vogel. I'm a local on Staten Island from South Beach, and I'm helping rebuild someone's home, get some kids back in the house for the one-year anniversary of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, I've been here pretty much every day since day one using the skills that I, I've known and also the skills that I've learned through other volunteers that have came out to give us a hand in helping rebuild people's homes. No money, no days off. But I have a good feeling in here. You know, it, it doesn't pay in money, but you know, inside, you know, changing people's lives, that's, that means a lot more to me. This lady, she was ready to give up on the house, just throw the keys in the mailbox and walk away. And we gave her hope. 
My name is Maria Piazio, and we're in the living room of my home in New York Beach. Rip everything out, everything. So every single thing, appliances, floors, walls, furniture, garbage. Because of, of yellow boots, Jason and Mike, it's been gutted. The roof was fixed. Um, Sheetrock was donated. Insulation was donated. Um, it was demolded twice. So it's getting there, but it's a long process. And it's just being done by volunteers, so it's a lot on their shoulders. There are no words. You, they are the difference between coming home and never getting able to come home. Um, they're the difference between hope and no hope. And their family now. I mean, even when the house is built, they will always be a part of our lives. I can, when they're finally back home and they're like, they can like, you know, actually put the mailbox back up and get the mail and cook a meal at home, that's, it's great. You know, it's, it's fulfilling. You know, you made an impact and it changes someone's life. The White House champions of change, receiving that honor meant a lot to me, not because of the, the title, but more so because it was my peers and the people that I helped that nominated me. You know, that means I touched that person's life enough for them to take a moment out of their time and be thankful. And it means I did my job. And I have a great team around me, and we all have the same mission in mind, you know? So even though I was the one sitting in the chair, I represent the masses. So Jeff, with all that's happened with Hurricane Sandy in Colorado, and also with what you've witnessed in uh, making the film Chasing Ice, what would you say is one of the biggest things that you learned from from all of this? That climate change is a man-made problem, but it's also a man-solvable problem. Yeah, both myself and our whole team, we've really actively done as much as we possibly can to, to minimize our footprint as well. Um, the film is carbon neutral through a sponsor that has helped us out with that. Um, I think eight different people on the team have switched over to driving hybrid cars. Two of them are driving electric cars. So it's something where we're really trying to be as conscious as we can. Speaking of the reality of chasing ice, uh, at the very end, there's a time-lapse sequence. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we show at the end of the film a bunch of different glaciers and what we've seen over the past four, five, or six years that we've been documenting them. And it's really powerful to watch as these glaciers are changing very quickly before your eyes. There's one glacier in particular, we show an animation where the glacier has retreated more in the last decade than it did in the last century prior to that. And when you start thinking about what those changes mean. Yes, glaciers have been changing for thousands and thousands of years, but we're seeing now that it's changing faster in 10 years than it did in 100 years. And this is representative of what's happening to a lot of different glaciers all around the Arctic. They're changing much faster now than they ever had before, and that's where people start understanding the, the consequences and the significance of it. And what is your hope for chasing ice? My hope is that if, if the film can shift opinion and can change people's hearts and minds about about climate change, about this issue, and if they can start to understand it in a, in a way that hits them emotionally, then I would consider that a success. And we've seen, we've heard so many stories of people being really impacted by the film. We just want to continue that outreach and that impact. So thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate you being here with us today, especially to help honor the victims of Hurricane Sandy and also the anniversary of the storm. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here with us since our first report since the storm. I'm Dilbar Shatterson, and from Staten Island, we'll see you soon.